in this video I'm going to be unpacking this book and trying to sort of give you a summary of what it says in the next five, ten minutes. Um, and hopefully it will ask you the question, you know, what does success look like for you? So that's what I'm hoping to get out of this video for you. So, just a quick caveat, um, and not to take away all of my credibility, but I am both dyslexic and an engineer, so that kind of takes away any kind of reading ability. Um, but really I'm just going to try and show you exactly what this book says from my perspective. So the overall theme of the book is sort of stated at the bottom here, which says making it in business without losing in life. Um, and it's split into seven chapters, um, each with a pretty clear heading that really explains what it means. So I'm just going to unpack each chapter a little bit and just highlight a story that stood out to me from that chapter. So let's get started. So the first chapter is don't settle for being money rich, time poor. And it's fairly clear what this is saying. It just says success does not directly equal money. Uh, there are many sort of aspects to success really. A lot of businesses nowadays uh, run on hustle culture, or at least they certainly did, uh, where you just have to work as long as you possibly could to earn as much money as you could. Um, and I think a lot of young people are questioning that these days uh, and asking for better work-life balance, which I think is great. But I think we still have a, a ways to go with that. And really that's what this chapter is sort of unpacking is, you know, what is more valuable to you, money or time? And I think a lot of people um, are starting to think that time is more valuable to them. One thing that Rob Parsons definitely notes is that he's not saying that you cannot work hard. Um, he recognises that there are times in your career, particularly if you're younger like me, at the start of your career, where you will have to work longer hours. But the really key caveat is that it does not become a lifestyle or something that you consistently do, because that's when you effectively lose your, your soul or lose your life, as some people would say. The second chapter is called Believe What You Do Makes a Difference. Now, the best way for me to illustrate this is just to tell one of the stories, which is about uh, Rob's father, who was a postman for his entire career. He joined the post office at the age of 14. Uh, and one day, I think, Rob, when he was younger, asked his dad, you know, don't you get bored delivering mail? Um, and I'm just going to read to you what he said in reply. So what he said was, Son, your father delivers the royal mail. He made it sound as if the Queen herself had asked him to do it. People rely on me. Businesses, armies and police forces, friends and relatives from overseas. I deliver all their letters. You should come with me someday and see somebody waiting at their door to see if I've got a letter for them. It may be about a job they've been hoping for or from a daughter they haven't heard from in a while. Or perhaps just a birthday card. No, son, I don't get bored. And that shows sort of really what, what it's talking about is that it doesn't really matter necessarily what your job is and how directly impactful it is for someone. It's do you believe that it is impactful and do you think it is valuable? Um, have you asked the, yourself the question, why do I do what I do? The third chapter is called Play to Your Strengths, Finding Your Factor X. Um, and again, it does, it kind of is obvious what this is talking about is playing to your strengths, finding that thing that you're really uniquely good at and really utilising it. It also challenges uh, business leaders to look for those people in their company that maybe aren't in a role currently where they are being utilised to the best of their abilities. One of the ways that Rob sort of unpacks it is um, George Orwell's Animal Farm, which is apparently quite a famous story. I hadn't actually heard of it before, but um, it effectively talks about a farm that is currently run by a group of pigs. And these pigs are trying to force um, certain animals to do different tasks around the farm. And a specific example is they're trying to get this turkey to put up a, a sign on a tree. And they've, they've been trying to get this turkey to do it for about a year. Uh, and they've they said that they've given it the right training and they've given it all of this, that and the other to try and help it do the job, but it just can't do it. Um, and within this meeting is an owl that sits in but is not allowed to speak. And the owl says, oh, well, why don't you get the squirrel to put up the sign on the tree? It's much better at climbing. And the pigs are like, absolutely not. No, we've been training this turkey to do it. The turkey will do it. And, you know, it's quite clear what, what the story is, is about. It's talking about finding what that person, what that character is uniquely good at and then utilising their strengths. Um, so that's, that's sort of the third chapter. So the question really for you is, what skills or strengths are you uniquely good at? If you don't know the answer to that question, then just ask uh, one of your closest friends or maybe one of your parents. And quite often they can tell you better what you're uniquely good at. Number four, the fourth chapter is, Believe in the power of dreams. Now this is a really interesting uh, chapter as it talks about sort of creativity and how people in business often don't have enough sort of dreamers working for them. A lot of people in business start out as dreamers and that's how they create their business. 
but once they start making money and have investors that rely on them, they get a lot more uh, cautious and a lot less creative. And actually we need to allow people to dream bigger. Rob argues that um, you need dream catchers um, to help dreamers. And this is just someone who will actually listen to what your ideas are and encourage you in them. And quite often I think we, we dismiss our ideas that are quite creative and interesting because we just think they're impossible. But just share it with someone um, and hopefully you never know it might come to fruition. So he tells a story of a man who was in a wheelchair and he had this dream to turn a sort of old patch of land into a uh, park that would be suitable for people in wheelchairs and other disabled people. And Rob was talking to him and at the time he just said, oh, I really don't think that's going to be achievable, that's quite a big ambition. And as you can imagine, many years went by and this guy um, made the right investments and did the right things and kept on working really hard until 10 years down the line he had this park for disabled people. And that's where Rob realised, oh, I really should have believed him better. So what are the dreams that you might have dismissed as ridiculous and have you shared them with anyone? The fifth chapter is uh, put your family before your career, which again is super obvious what it's showing, um, but it talks about the importance of this, particularly I think relating to people with families as well, less so relating to people my age, but putting your family before your career is really important, he says, and he tells a story which I'm going to read word for word from here because it's so good. A couple of years ago, when I was lecturing to a hundred or so businessmen and women, I was in the middle of a session where I was talking about some of the issues I've mentioned above. Suddenly a man in the middle of the room interrupted me. He shouted out, It's true that I earn a lot of money, but I'm doing it for my kids. As he shouted, a vivid illustration came to me that I had heard used before. I asked him the name of his youngest and the age of his youngest. He told me that Ben was two years old. I then asked him to imagine a long steel building girder that was just four inches wide. I said, now, we let it along Park Lane. It's on the ground and quite safe. Ben and I are at one end and you are at the other. Would you walk along it towards me for 50 pounds? He looked a little startled, but he said he would. Now we left the girder by helicopter and suspend it over the horseshoe fall in Niagara. He'd been there, but I reminded him that the falls were 176 feet high and that 600,000 gallons of water per second fell over the 2,600 foot brink. You're on one side and Ben and I are on the other. It's rainy and windy. In fact, the girder is swaying a little. The water is crashing and thundering below us. I thought I saw him change colour. Now, will you walk along the girder to us for 50 pounds? In no uncertain terms, he told me that he wouldn't. Will you do it for 1,000 pounds? No. A million? No. I got him up to 10 million. He still refused. Then I said, now imagine that suddenly through the spray you see that Ben has crawled along the girder and is now 15 feet out and frozen in fear. He is screaming. The man didn't hesitate. From the middle of the Hilton ballroom, we heard a managing director in a pinstripe suit yell out, I'm coming. I said, don't forget this moment. You care for that child more than anything else on the face of the earth. Don't be so busy being successful that you miss his life. At the end of the seminar, he came to me and said simply, you switched a light on for me. Nothing more to really say about that. That's just such a good illustration. The sixth uh, chapter is called Keep the Common Touch. So he simply refers to this as giving dignity to all who you interact with, no matter how high or low they are in relation to your role. He tells the story of this managing director of a company who has arranged for a chauffeur to pick him up every single day at the exact same time. And this managing director sees the chauffeur as just a tool and the chauffeur is not allowed to speak to him and has to, once the director gets in the car, closes the door, he just has to drive off and go straight to work and not talk to him. Now one day the director uh, got in the car and realised he's forgotten some papers and so he had to pop quickly back out to the house. Now, as you can imagine, the chauffeur just drove off without him, not realising he wasn't in the car. Um, now, naturally, the chauffeur got fired, but you can see the, the sort of implications of that and the fact that this guy did not have the common touch. He didn't respect the chauffeur at all um, and ended up paying for it in that way by not getting to work on time. So the question really is, how do you treat those who are below you, to the side of you and above you? Um, a lot of times we talk about how when you move up the ladder, uh, the way you treat those who you go past can often really affect you as you come back down and they come up. And finally, the last chapter is called Don't Settle for Success. Make a difference, strive for significance. 
So he tells a story here of one of his friends who was an, a chartered accountant and this guy uh, was on an aeroplane with one other man and a pilot and the other man uh, owned half of the plane as well as the pilot and this guy, the chartered accountant, was laying out his life goals for the next 10 years and really he was laying out how much money he wanted to earn in 10 years time and he was asking his friend for help and, and trying to figure out how he could reach these goals and then suddenly the, one of the engines started uh, misbehaving and the pilot said that it completely stopped working and they were going to have a very rough landing uh, and on a smaller plane I think that's a bigger deal than on bigger jet planes um, and straight away at that moment apparently um, Rob says that this guy said that his viewpoint completely shifted. His goals had changed from how much money can I make to can I be a better father, can I be a better uh, son. It sort of suddenly switched to relationships and striving for significance rather than just money. Many people talk about this and Rob talks about this in the book in that money does not directly bring happiness and that many of his friends who have made it millions have said that it's not enough and actually having significance in your job and actually helping people is also so so important for feeling successful so rob says that he often runs a seminar for businessmen and women and he often gets them to sit still for 60 seconds and he quite often says that some of these people just cannot do it um, but he often gets them to sit still with the question what is it all for so that's the question I want to just leave with you from this book is what is it all for? What looks like success for you? So this book is really interesting because all of these helpful facts I've just taken you through um, are interwoven with another story that is uh, talking about a man um, who is an old business professor teaching a younger man um, how to make it in business, which is where the title comes from. Um, and this younger man has just recently had his dad pass away and his dad was a very successful businessman but never spent time with his son. And that's sort of how he sort of tells a story uh, along the way. So I strongly recommend that if you want to read this and, and have found this video interesting, give it a go. It was written in 2002, so it is older, but I think it still has a lot of relevance for, for today. Thank you so much for watching. Um, I really hope you found this helpful or interesting. If you want to watch any more of my videos, then you'll see my latest videos somewhere around here. Um, I tend to make videos about placements, work, and rest, and things like that, and productivity. Um, so yeah, I hope you found this helpful, and I will see you in the next video.